gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Gail Dye. Thank you. Okay, so this is the talk. How have we gotten to the place where we've gotten? Just last week, I was invited on MSNBC, which is a cable news show, by Melissa Harris Perry, who is not your normal talk show host. She's actually a PhD in political science, an African American woman, smart, writes great stuff about race and gender in the United States of America. So I got invited. And let me tell you, after 20 years of dealing with the media, I know that until I am sitting in that studio with that camera rolling, there is no insurance that I'm going to be on that show. So I get invited. They're telling me I'm going to send me all my directions and how to get there, how to get to New York. And that was Sunday. And I was meant to go on Saturday. Tuesday, no call. Wednesday, no call. So I know now something's going on. So I email and I said, you know, I'm waiting for directions to where I'm staying in New York, what hotel. And I get an email saying, oh, the segment is, quote, changing. Well, yes, changing. Note, not cancelled, changing. So automatically my feminist antenna go up and I think, yeah, what does this mean? Well, let me tell you what changing means. It means going from a radical feminist critique of the porn industry to inviting on to speak about pornography a woman called Tristan Taramino. Does anyone know this? Yeah. Yeah. Tristan Taramino, you might not know this. She's a feminist. She just happens to work with the pornographers and all the most disgusting, vile misogynists in the world you've ever met, but she calls herself a feminist. And when I said that I was bumped by a pornographer, I was told by Christine Taramino on Twitter, how dare Gail Dine say that she was bumped by a pornographer because I too am a feminist. <laughs> so it would seem Bill Gates is obviously a socialist. He gives money out. I mean, if you can call yourself anything you want, then what does our movement mean? OK, so this is where identity politics has gotten us. It's gotten to this ridiculous point where you can basically partner with every misogynist in the world, but because you've got a vagina, you can argue you're a feminist. So what we're going to talk about is how did we get to this absolutely crazed place. So let's begin with this statement. This is one of the leaders of third wave feminism called Jennifer Baumgardner. And she wrote on Alternet, which is a um, radical site, well, a kind of liberal lefty, feminism is something individual to each feminist. Yes, sisters, you might have thought feminism was a movement that we all had certain assumptions about. But no, it's individual to what you actually think it is. So what does this mean and how the hell did we get here? OK, in a couple of generations, how have we gone from radical feminism in your face, fuck you, to this? So let's figure this out. And of course, to begin, we have to begin with these two. So what we're going to look at is how the world changed post Reagan Thatcher. Now, this was a critical moment in history because the critical moment in history was that the attempt to build a somewhat collective society post Second World War was completely undermined by these two. This was when neoliberalism on the ground really began. And what I'm going to do in this talk is to talk about how neoliberalism has destroyed feminism. It's also destroyed the entire world as well and the economy. But specifically, I'm going to focus in on how we get to this absolutely ridiculous statement that feminism is about what you make it, you make it, you make it, you make it. It's all our own individual empowerment, you know, and how we act in the world. So let's look at what they basically say. So... The key to this was a statement that Margaret Thatcher once made, which is actually breathtaking. There is no such thing as society, only individual men and women. And when she said that, you've got to see this was the crux of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism acts as if we're all individuals. There's nothing collective, there's no class interest, there's no collective interest. But I'm going to argue, as we go through, that that's only true for the oppressed. Believe me, the oppressor class know that this is full of shit. They understand what it means to act as a class, OK? It's only us, the oppressed, who are not meant to act as a class. So neoliberalism, as a political movement, what does it mean? Well, it has certain tenets. The first, of course, is free market economy. Absolutely no intervention 
by the government. And of course, the reason for that is because capitalists know that the only thing big enough to put any limits to their power is government. So you have this whole ideology that government's bad, you can't have any intervention in the government, which of course leaves them free reign. Minimal state intervention, limited social programs, because if you're poor, it's because you're a lazy shit who can't get out of bed in the morning. Free trade, very crucially, because we have to destroy any potential for developing countries to compete. Strong property rights of the rich. You have laws that basically are all about protecting the property rights of the rich. Mass privatization. And I live in the United States of America. And if you think you know what privatization is here, you ain't got a clue, right? Not one clue. And then, of course, weak unions. The absolute need to destroy anything collective on the power of the oppressed. So we have this. OK, Julia? Now, what does capitalism look like? <laughs> All right. What better way for me to analyse capitalism than the fact that all these major corporations control virtually everything you do, everything you see, everything you eat, everything you wear, everything you buy. This is what capitalism is like on the ground. And what you have now are a few multinationals who control virtually all of the world's economy. And they are kind of not founded in any country. They wander around the globe laying waste to any country that they happen to go to at any moment. And as soon as individual workers start to organise in, I don't know, China or India, off they go to find another country to lay waste to. So, now let's think about what's happened post-Thatcher and post-Reagan, because this is what it's all about. Neoliberalism is about Robin Hood in reserve. It is about sucking money from the poor to the rich. Remember Robin Hood used to give from the rich? To, well, forget this. We're doing the other way around now. We suck up we, from the poor to the rich. And to just give you an example, right? think about this. The income of the top 1% increased 265% between 1979 and 2006, while the lowest 20% rose by an average of 11%. What you have seen is absolute and utter class warfare. You have seen the working class and the poor decimated by the 1%. And this is the result. The fact that there was almost a global economic meltdown was no accident. It was years in the making. It was carefully strategized. And the fact is today in the United States of America, the level of inequality today is the same as before the Great Depression in the 30s. Right, that's the state the United States of America is in. And let me tell you, America is everyone's future. You understand that, right? What goes on in America first, everyone then tries to bring round the rest of the world. So you should always keep your eyes on the United States of America. And as I'm saying this, I'm just thinking I'm probably not going to get back in the country on Wednesday, but never mind. <laughs> OK, right. Now, how does this mean in race? How it means in race, specifically... This is black unemployment, this is white unemployment. Studies show in America that the recession has basically wiped out all the economic gains that African Americans made post-civil rights because they were the ones targeted for the mortgages that went underwater. They will never, ever again buy homes. They are finished. And so African Americans and Hispanics, and especially women, carry the burden of the global recession on their shoulders like nobody else, which of course means the poorer you are, the more likely you are to work really cheaply. And that's, again, what's crucial. And I want to quote a great friend of mine, Cynthia Enlow, a wonderful radical feminist economist, who said there's there's no such thing as cheap labour. There's labour made cheap. And that's what the recession has done. It has made labour cheap. So let's think about this as human beings. Most of us are born with empathy, OK? And what oppression has to do is destroy our capacity for empathy. Because otherwise, we would all be up in arms, enraged at the fact that there's people out there who are oppressed. So how do you make sure? that those of us who are not starving, that those of us who have the riches that the world has to offer, how do you make sure that we don't march and say it's not fair? What you do is you create a material reality, i.e. capitalism, which is unfair, and then you develop an ideological support system to legitimise that inequality. That is always key. You cannot have inequality 
the material reality of limited access to resources for the majority without having an attendant ideology that legitimizes that inequality. Right? And this is what we're going to talk about, is how you create an ideology that says it's okay that 1% have the majority of the resources. It's okay that women are in pornography and the sex industry. It's okay that people of color are relegated to either prisons or non-labor and non-employment. It's okay because we have this whole ideology that explains it away for us and makes it clear. So what we're going to look at is how ideological systems create justification for inequality. So. Now, if you ever want to understand ideology, the person who you always go to first is Karl Marx. This is your go-to person on understanding inequality. So let's take what Marx said. And he said, and I'm going to quote him here, the ruling class rule as thinkers, as producers of ideas, and regulate the production and distribution of the ideas of their age. Thus, their ideas... The ideas of the ruling class are the ruling ideas of the epoch. Notice he is not saying the ruling class are all individuals just thinking by themselves. <laughs> right? He understood better than anybody that the ruling class to maintain their power act as a ruling class. It's just the rest of us who are meant to be all individuals wandering around not knowing what day it is. They know exactly what's going on. So now we have to figure out how is it possible that a small percentage of the population control the way most of us think, control ideology. And I have to say, if you want an example on the ground right now of how the ruling ideas are controlling women, then the fact that the Fifty Shades of Grey is number one, two, and three is no better than an example of how the ideology of patriarchy has set up home in women's minds. I'm going to talk about that a bit later. I'm going to go through it. Don't worry, OK? Now, how do ideas reproduce themselves? Right, when you own 1% of the population, or rather of the economy, you actually don't leave this shit to chance. You understand? You set up an entire system that ensures the reproduction of your power. So the first and most important thing is that you own most of the media. So we know that the corporations own Disney, News Corporation, Time Warner, and Viacom. The right-wing talk shows in the United States of America are central for the reproduction of right-wing ideology. We've got Rush Limbaugh, we've got Savage, we've got Hannity, we've got Medved, we've got all of these people. Just a very funny thing. When the Obamacare passed okay, through the Supreme Court, Rush Limbaugh said, if it passes, I'm moving to Costa Rica. <laughs> no, no, wait. Guess what Costa Rica's got? National health care. <laughs> right? That's the brains of these people. And then everyone was writing on Facebook, why wait? Go now, OK? <laughs> Don't wait. So what you do is you control the media. This is absolutely crucial. And you use your control of the media to ensure that you shut down any alternative discourse that could in any way question the right of the elite to maintain their power. OK. Now, you also get control of think tanks. Now, in the United States of America, post-Second World War, the right wing got to work because what happened is that they realized that with the New Deal in the 1945s, 50s, when there was really an attempt, somewhat a little bit, not much, but a little attempt to redistribute wealth, the right wing went into action instantaneously. And they developed think tanks called the Cato Institute, the Heritage, the American Enterprise, all of these things. Now, what these think tanks do is they bring in right-wing economists, no shortage of right-wing economists, as you all know. They bring them in, they create position papers, and then they basically interface with the main media. Now, most journalists in the media have no clue what day it is, let alone how the economy works. So they become extremely dependent on the kind of stuff that these think tanks give out. So then you begin to create what's called a hegemony, a way of thinking, a dominant way of thinking. This is a, a Marxist Italian called Antonio Gramsci came out with a theory called hegemony. And what that is, is it is the ruling ideas of the society that become the dominant way that most people think. And you, again, you don't leave this shit to chance. You make sure you control the institutions so that everybody begins to think like that. So let's carry on, because the next institution that's very important is education. Now, this is from Bowles and Gintis, two Marxist 
um, educators who, by the way, got thrown out of Harvard for their radical views. And they said, very interestingly, to reproduce the social relations of production, the education system must try to teach people to be subordinate and render them sufficiently fragmented individual in consciousness to preclude their getting together to shape their own material existence. So we're all individuals and feminism is all about individualism because of course what we're doing is we're precluding the possibility of women understanding that they stand together as a class with collective class interests. Instead we're individuals. So how do they do this? How do the educators do this? The most key way is they, <laughs> they bore you to death, right? How many of you in your high school years were completely bored to death? I mean, absolutely, right? Do you think that they forgot to educate us? You see, when you think about education as training on the job, most jobs under capitalism are shit work. They require an intense amount of tolerance for boredom. So you train the workers for boredom in high school. Right? So by the time you leave school, your ability to sit there for four hours and do nothing but surreptitiously look at your watch is a great training program for the work you're going to get in capitalism, which is intense boredom. They also marginalise radicals, okay? Very, very key. And if we've got any really good ideas, and I don't know about you, but I think radicals have excellent ideas, they co-opt them and they then bleed them dry of their politics so they become absolutely meaningless and, in fact, get caught up in the hegemony, which is very important because then we become part of the hegemony so our ideas sound like we're just basically spouting the mainstream. Very, very clever way to marginalise. So, what is the new hegemony of the academy? It is postmodernism meets neoliberalism, okay? And that has absolutely killed feminism. Now, postmodernism at times had potential possibilities. There's some really interesting ideas in there about how power works. But it's always a living, breathing text. Postmodernist theory and some of the stuff that Foucault said about the way in which power seeps down onto the individual could be used by radicals. But put those ideas in a neoliberal setting and they shift. So what happened with postmodernism meeting neoliberalism is we ended up with a notion of the individual. Now, in neoliberalism, the absolute core of neoliberalism is that there is an individual and the individual has free choice. And how many of here are you sick to death of people saying choice, 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 yeah. oh, right? Choice, choice, choice. Okay, this is all we have. Well, it's your choice, it's your choice, it's your choice, okay? So it is very crucial to make it look like we are all acting out of our free choice instead of having a social structure. So let's think about what this means to talk about individual and free choice. So in neoliberalism, there is the sovereignty of the individual. That means that the only thing that matters, the only level of analysis, is the individual, decontextualized from the collective realities of that individual's life. So coming from classical economics, the individual is seen as rational, as calculating, as pragmatic, and as maximizing their own welfare, right? So you can't critique that person over there. Why? Because they know what's best for them. They're maximising their own welfare. And who are you to suggest that's anything different? Everything's relative. Nobody's allowed a political position because political positions become judgments, right? Are you judging me? I remember once being in, a, um, in Las Vegas at the porn um, convention. So imagine this. Every year in January... All the pornography industry come to Las Vegas. 10,000 fans and me descend into <laughs> Las Vegas, okay? So we go there and, I mean, it's the most bizarre sight you've ever seen. There's just a huge football field room, pornography everywhere, all on the walls, all the pornographers, all the pimps coming with their stable of prostituted women, pimping out, just horrendous. And then in the middle of all of this porn world, what you have are average business guys who basically supplement the porn industry. So I'm going up to one guy and he makes the lights, okay? He makes the lights for the porn 
industry. He actually is an electrician. That's what he does. He's not in pornography. He's an electrician. He sells lights. to. So he's got his whole light set up. And his lights are really good because it doesn't melt the makeup. So he's explaining this to me. So I'm nodding and, you know, writing notes, pretending to be interested. So he's telling me how he does this. And I say, oh, how interesting you make that. And then I said to him, I said, do you have daughters? He said, yes. He said, I have three daughters. I said, oh, I said, um, I said, and how do you feel working for an industry that's making their life even more dangerous than it already is? And of course, the smile drops from his face because they're not used to having anyone. And he said to me, are you judging me? And I said, <laughs> I said, yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm judging you, right? So the idea is in this kind of neoliberal empowerment, choice, choice, choice world, God forbid you make a judgment, okay, because politics don't matter. Okay, so we've got the sovereignty of the individual, and let's think about how that translates. We're back to there's no such thing as society, only individual men and women, okay. So this is where we're at now. We're back to the Margaret Thatcher view, which was held by her individually, which then Ronald Reagan developed into politics and then started to float in the air. Because let me tell you how hegemony works. It's not like somebody comes up to you, sits you down and reads you the dominant ideology and makes you spout it back. That, in fact, is a very inefficient system. The best way to do this is to have it everywhere. So it's literally in the air that you breathe. Now, that is true everywhere. So when you read People magazine, you read the Daily Mail, wherever you go, you watch television, that hegemony is actually so normalized that it's rendered invisible. And that is always the best way to control somebody. You render the ideology invisible by normalizing it to the point it's just like the air you're breathing. OK, so what do you mean people don't have choice? Of course they have choice. So you try and argue against that when people have been born into a culture that has normalized that view. Now, the problem with the neoliberal view is that in neoliberalism, there is no such thing as structural inequality. There are no systems of oppression. There are no groups with collective interests. Now, importantly, that means the oppressed have no collective interest and neither do the oppressor. Except we know the oppressor meets regularly, for example, in Davos, Switzerland. So let's imagine that. You've got the oppressor class, and they meet once a year there, and they meet in other places. And what do you think they talk about in Davos? What they have for dinner? Right? What are they planning in Davos? They're planning how to basically control the world for the next year. They understand their collective interests. And then, of course, they fund industries and organizations and education that tells us that we have no collective interests. Well, they full well act as if they do. So in this neoliberal world, there are just lots of individuals making lots of individual choices with lots of self-empowerment. <laughs> Who can argue with that? Okay, this is the world that we all live in. So now we come to a perfect storm of postmodernism <laughs> plus neoliberalism ends up with third wave feminism. So what happens is, and I have debated many of these younger women, and when I say third wave, I want to make something clear. This is not a generational issue. It is an ideological battle, not a generational one, okay? Absolutely. And I think we need to stop calling ourselves second wave because that makes us look history and makes us like dinosaurs. We are the future, we are not the past, right? If we are going to save anything from this economic, an environmental, an environmental collapse, an environmental and economic and cultural collapse. If we are going to do anything as a radical feminist movement around that, we have to start thinking of ourselves as the future and not as the past. And we're going to talk about that. So now, sorry, can you go back? When I say third wave feminists, I want to make something clear. There was some good stuff that came out of those who call themselves third wave. The analysis around intersectionality and how render, re gender, race and class intersect was very, very useful for us beginning to think about the ways in which women's race and gender intersect and mediate and shift their class and their gender analysis. Very, very crucial. Right? So I don't want to sort of have this broad brush that it was all awful. But when I'm talking about third wave, I'm talking about feministing, I'm talking about Jezebel, I'm talking about some of Ms. Magazine, all of these. I'm talking about the feminism 
in the air. And I, I just want to share something with you, very interesting that happened to me the first time ever. So just give us a sense of where we're at. You know, for those of us who are teachers and we teach courses in college, I'm sure we all ask the same question of our students day one. How many of you call yourself a feminist? And we all know the answer, like maybe one. Yeah? So then you ask them why. And of course, what answers do you think you get? Yeah, and why don't they why, why don't they want to call themselves feminists? What what they don't want to hate men, they want to shave under their arms and everywhere else now, but whatever. There's always these reasons, right? But the big thing is I don't want to be a man hater. Different now. You know what my students said to me last semester? And I almost fall out of my chair. I said, why don't you call yourselves feminists? And they said, well, and I swear I am not making this up. They said, well, doesn't feminism mean like you have to fuck every guy and I don't feel comfortable with that? Oh. Isn't that profound? Isn't that profound that the feminism in the air now is that you, they said, doesn't that mean you just like screw them all and fuck them all? And, and I don't like, that's not for me, they said. Do you understand what a shift that is? Do you? No, no, I've never heard that. This is, this is, I am telling you from 25 years of teaching, I have never, and you know what? Because the in the air is third wave feminism. And I'm going to explain how we got there. But that is a profound comment, okay? And that turns everything upside down. So let's get into this perfect storm of neoliberalism and uh, postmodernism. So, okay, so we're back to this. So let's think, how do we get to this notion that somebody who wrote, you know, a lot of the third wave stuff comes out with something about this. And to just show how ridiculous it is, let's imagine this. That's next one, Julie. Imagine this, the labor movement is something individual to each worker. All right, take that for a minute. Take that concept that the labor movement, and let's ask, how then would we have built a labor movement? Well, you know, you might feel oppressed by working for minimum wage, but it works for me, I'm empowered. Right? So we would have no movement. Would you all agree if the labor movement believed that? Okay, let's take this. The civil rights movement is something individual to every person of colour, right? So how you make it work for yourself is fine. You know, go, see what you can do. So let's just give an example a little bit more of this. Now, the Jim Crow South in America was from the 1876s to 1965. It was the time of official segregation, right? The different water fountains, the, where you could basically murder African Americans as whites and walk away from it. It was a time post-slavery that for many African Americans said had as much violence in it as the period of slavery, right? So it was a dreadful time. However, even though you had the most incredible level of oppression in the Jim Crow South. What historians found is that black ownership of land during Jim Crow was actually about 15 million acres. So let's take this for a moment. And let's say, how can you say the Jim Crow South is oppressive to all blacks? Because some managed to own land. Right? So then it's Martin Luther King could have stood up and said, not I have a dream, which was about a collective movement. He could have stood up and said, I have a discourse which is individual. Could you imagine a lecture? I have a discourse, and that discourse comes out of my individual dreams. Because what he could argue is, indeed, we have 15 million acres owned by blacks. Doesn't that show you the Jim Crow South doesn't really work? What I'm trying to say here is, even in the face of structural inequality, okay, you can have people who can make it work for them. Systems of oppression are flexible enough to absorb some members of subordinate groups. Indeed, they draw strength from the illusion of neutrality provided by these exceptions. And this is what happens when you make social theory based on the most elite members of your group, you end up with third wave feminism. Right? Could you imagine, as I say, making a civil rights movement based on the few big landowners in the Jim Crow South? So let's begin to think about how, when you focus specifically on the elite, which is what my feminism was never about. Okay? I did not join a feminism that was about making me, my life, better. Okay? I'm fine, thank you very much. Okay? I joined it about something else. So let's talk about this. 
So again, back to Marx. Let's talk about what this means in terms of choice. Men make their own history, but they do not make it just, and let's forget the men, let's mean women, but they make it as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given, and transmitted from the past. You are born into a culture where there are dynamics and systems of oppression in place, which doesn't mean to say for some you can't make it work. But remember that you are not born into a society as a free agent, wandering around the culture, figuring out what's best for you. If you're rich, white, male, then maybe. But the rest of us who do not look like that, who do not profile that, like that, have a very different world. So, when we hear about agency, and, and I have to say, I can't stand the word choice, but agency is getting very close as well. Do you find that? Agency, agency, agency. Okay, so let's do agency, agency, agency. So people always say to me after I finish lecturing, where's women's agency in all of this? So I say, okay, you can ask that question. The answer to that is, it's an empirical question. I'm a sociologist. So my question to you would be, do you mean my agency? of an upper middle class, white, highly educated woman? Or do you mean the agency of the women who are gonna come in and clean the floors when you're done and gone home? Because you better be very certain which agency you're calling about. Me, I have so much fucking agency, I don't know what to do with it, okay? <laughs> it's seeping everywhere. But that does not mean that those women who work two jobs to put food on the table, who work against everything that this society tells them, they're pieces of shit and they have no right to live. Those women who do that and put food on the table and mother their children and do all of that, it's their agency. That's the feminism I joined, to fight for their agency, not me, right? And what has happened in third wave is that it's all about me, it's all about us, and it's all about those of us with choice, right? So when I'm asked the agency, you say it's an empirical question. We can actually track agency. We can look at the socioeconomic realities of that individual woman, and then we can decide what kind of agency that woman has. Okay, so let's look at agency. Women perform 66% of the world's work. They produce 50%, but earn 10% of the income and own 1% of the property. Right, that's the reality of the world for women. Women who work full time only own 77% of what men make, and 13% 30, of women over 75 are poor compared to 6% of men. Women are 70% of the world's poor. And remember something, whenever you put women, you add children. Because children are in the place they're in because women are in the place they're in. The lives of children will never improve till you improve the lives of their mother. Which is why any movement that <coughs> fights to better children's lives and is not feminist is doomed for failure. Absolutely doomed for failure. Okay, and then of course, when you get into race, it gets even worse. 26.5% of African-American women are poor, 23.6% of Hispanic women are poor, and you can see here. So again, when some white 40-something third waver gets up and screams about agency, I want to talk about this agency. This is where our feminism should be, and this is what we've lost in the third wave. So let's talk about how it plays out on the ground. Okay, so a little bit of advertising for my book. <laughs> right. Let me tell you about capitalism. I get 80 cents for every one sold, okay? So that tells you something like that. <laughs> right, now, just in case anyone thinks I'm getting rich on this. So when my book came out, okay, it was, I have to say, it's been two years since it came out. And I wish I could write it again with the experiences of what happens when you put a book out. And what I just found out, I have to say, it was actually somebody's, the Chinese rights have been bought. And it's been um, basically translated into Chinese. And I found out yesterday that in the Barnes and Noble of Taiwan, it's the book of the month in August. So that's great, yeah. So that's good news. So, okay, my book comes out and I brace myself because I know that feminist movement is going to come after me. It's going to go for the throat, okay? And indeed, I was not upset by that. I was not surprised by that. So I wanted to give you some of the criticisms I got from the third wave feminist movement to just show you how feminism has lost its way, okay? How mainstream feminism has lost its way. So in my book, what I do 
is I take a critical analysis using structural frameworks to really explain how pornography works. I look at it as an industry which interfaces with all other mainstream industries, which include the credit card companies, the bank companies, the hotel companies, the IT companies, the real estate companies. Pornography is not a fantasy. Fantasy happens in the head, porn happens in the international banks of capital, okay? So first of all, it's not a fantasy. I also explore it as a discourse. What are the messages? What is the messages coming to men about sexuality, about masculinity, about femininity. What does it say about heterosexuality, connection, intimacy, all of those things? And I also look at it in terms of the men. Because we'll notice something else about third wave feminism. It's a feminism without men. They don't talk about men. They talk about women all the time, right? As if we're the only ones that matter. This is like, you know, talking about race and forgetting the fact that the whites are the racists, okay? So when I talk about feminism and pornography, I want to talk about men because men make pornography, men get rich off pornography, men jerk off to pornography. It seems to me we should be talking about men when we talk about pornography, not women, okay? Except about the women's lives in it and how it impacts on them. So my book comes out and I, a Ms. Magazine, which is, you know, the, one of the biggest... Um, uh, feminist magazines in America tells me right that they don't have any room in their print copy to do a review of my book the first anti-porn book by a feminist in 15 years and Ms magazines run out of any space but they will give me the blog and then of course who jumps in to do the blog but a woman called Shira Tarrant is anyone familiar with her okay so Shira Tarrant is a very good example of third wave feminism. So what I'm going to do is sort of walk you through some of the criticisms of her, my book from her <coughs> because I think they really focus well on what's going on. So let's start with. So Shira Tarrant's first argument is that what I do is I leave no agency for the women in pornography. What I say is that they are victims of a predatory industry. I say that they get there through economic inequality, through racism, through sexual abuse. So, and then she takes me to task on this. So what she does is she quotes April Flores, who is herself in the porn industry. And she said, there is no doubt that porn is a very physical job. However, it is also a very individualized profession. Each performer is responsible for their own physical health. A performer always has the choice of not doing something they are not comfortable with. Right, so let's take this apart. Okay. Let's deconstruct. April Flores, when you interview April Flores, she's on the job. You understand this. This is how she makes the money. So supposing April Flores says, you know what? My God, Gail Dines is right. Right? They treat us like pieces of shit. Or, is she going to get a job the next day? Right? So first and foremost, never ask a woman in the sex industry to talk about the sex industry. There was a wonderful woman called Norma Hoteling. Did anyone know Norma? Mm -hmm. Wonderful woman who had been an exited woman from prostitution. And she started this organization called SAGE on the West Coast. And I heard her talk and she said something profound. She said, never ask a woman who's been in the sex industry to talk about it until she's been out at least five years. She says, it takes that long to be able to figure out and process what happened to you. So meanwhile, April Flores, who I don't know anything about this woman's life, what I do know is she's in the industry. This is how she makes her money. What the hell is she going to say? So this is taken as criticism of me. Right? My analysis, based in the structural realities of the porn industry, is rendered invisible. And in its place, we have one person saying it's individualized. This is like saying, you know, Karl Marx got it wrong. He really did. He doesn't realize that basically working for a factory is an individualized expression. How dare he make generalizations about alienated labor? Right? Did he interview every single worker to come up with this? So these, this is showing you how crazy all of this is, right? And then I argue, though, if you're going to talk about porn and women, I want to know what about the men. Let's focus on the men a little bit, which not anywhere do third wave feminists talk about and certainly not in my review. So she's saying, April Floor, is that basically you can do anything you want. You can say no, which, of course, we know is not true. Once you sign that contract and you get on that set, you are 18 years old. You come from the middle of... America somewhere. You think you know what's going to happen to you on the set. You have no clue. 
You are 18, you are naked, you are surrounded by men, clothed, you have a camera up your vagina, one in your anus, you have three men sticking their penis in every orifice, calling you a bitch and a whore and a cunt. You tell me what power you have at that moment, because that's not what you were thinking you're going to happen. Nobody talks about that. What are you going to do? And I know from my interviews, because I, after I wrote that book, I got a ton of interviews from people in the porn industry to tell me what it's really like, what it's really like. And I got a director who called me up, who actually I interview in the book, and he recognised himself. And he said, you are completely right. I have left the industry. Don't feel not sorry for the fucker who was there for 15 years, so he made a lot of money, but at least eventually he did get out, okay? And um, he said, I want you to know something. He said, everything you say in there is right. He said, and you know when I left? I left, he said, when every single time I went off to a photo shoot and the direct, the producer, because he was a director, he said, and I would be leaving for a photo shoot and the producer would call me and he said his exact words to me, and I'm quoting now, were, wreck the bitch. Right? This is what he told me. Wreck the bitch. So this is the reality of the industry. Okay, so let's think about what goes on for these women. And it says, this is a man called Jules Jordan, who is one of the most hardcore pornographers in the world. He himself has said, one of the things about today's porn and the extreme market, the gonzo market, so many fans want to see so much more extreme stuff. I'm always trying to figure out ways to do something different. So you understand this? They're running out of ideas. They don't know what to do because they have created such a taste for violent porn. And these guys are big businessmen, right? They do not want to break the law. You understand this? There's limits. They have to work within the limits of the law because you have millions and millions at stake here. So they are now up against a wall. They have done everything they can to a woman's body short of killing her, and they don't know what to do. So let's just talk about this and see what's next. So one of the big things in pornography in fact, in all mainstream gonzo hardcore pornography is gagging. This is where they put the penis so far down the throat, okay, that it actually activates the gag reflex. They also put a lot of mascara on her. So as her eyes water, you're watching it because they like to see empirical proof that she's choking. I mean, she is choking. You hear the gagging. It makes you gag, okay? So this is every single gonzo film now is her on a chair, usually with a head back, penis so far down. And as she's gagging, they're saying, look at me, look at me in the face. So she's gagging, she's looking up, and sometimes even worse, as I'm going to show. Now, let me take you to adult DVD. This is where the porn aficionados hold, hang out. It is a discussion group. And they ask each other questions. So Hot Boy 1999 puts the question forward on adult DVD, the chat, the porn chat. He says, I love the hardcore face fucking, the women drooling, the gagging and the puke scenes. And what he's asking his friends for is, can you give me some suggestions where I can go? No shortage of friends on this site because in comes Panas and he says, if you like roughest, it could be the Jessica scene. At one point, she stops the scene crying. If you like vomit, go for baby doll. So they give each other information, right? And what they'll say is at three minutes, 42 seconds, you'll see the gagging, the vomiting starting. And I went to this and baby doll and sure enough, vomiting. And they keep it in, vomiting, vomiting, vomiting. So this is the way they speak to each other. So again, let's think about Shira Tarrant interviewing one woman who says you can do whatever you want and it's not that bad and then these men know that's a piece of shit they understand the level of violence and when you read them they get exactly what's happening to the women so the other thing in porn that's standard now is anal sex now in porn anal sex is rough it's hard it's painful and its goal is to deliver to her the message just what a filthy stinking horse she is that's the idea of anal sex so you have things like altered asshole anal suffering let me show you a promotional copy for this this is a promotional copy for the film a nearly ripped horse right and this is what it says this is the promotional copy we at pure filth know exactly what you want and we're giving it to you Chicks being ass fucked till their sphincters are pink, puffy, and totally blown out. Adult diapers just might be in store for these whores when their work is done. Okay? So this is the empowering porn industry where women are making lots of choices to maximize their own rational well-being. This is the reality of the porn industry. When I argue with many women 
and men about porn, older men, they're not thinking this. They're thinking Playboy 10 years ago. Part of the problem is that this, for all of it being a multi-billion dollar a year industry, is a stealth industry. I, how many people really understand that this is mainstream? This is the major form of sex education in the world today for boys 12 and up. And girls. And girl. Less so for Gonzo. Girls don't go to Gonzo. We can talk about that later. But the, the statistics still show that girls are not going to Gonzo. Right? Gonzo, this level of hardcore, is still male. Doesn't mean it won't change in a few years. But at this moment, when I interview the porn producers, they tell me this is mainly for men. Okay? That's what they say. Now... So let's go back to adult DVD talk and let's see what AC Cream has to say. And this is the kinds of things they post. The most real painful scene I've ever seen is Gangbang Auditions number three from Diabolic. The scene with Aspen Brook. The guys start asking her questions like, you like that dick in your ass, but she's in such pain her answers are hard to understand. She tried to say something like, I love it, but then the tears started flowing. A porn chick not handling dick gave me a major bone age, I recall. So, bone age, a boner, uh, uh, an erection. Okay, so let's think about then the reality. So again, you've got third wave feminists wanting to talk about women and how empowered they are in pornography. And yet, could anyone here get a sense that this man, when he's watching it, thinking, oh my God, she's so empowered. <laughs> I had no idea women had such economic, social, and legal power. Who knew? Right? I mean, do you realize how ridiculous third wave feminism is when you put it up against the empirical realities? Okay, so, and then listen, don't believe me. Go to the source itself. This is Adult Industry Medical Healthcare Association. This was the Volunteer Healthcare Association of the Porn Industry. It's since got closed down for complex reasons. But during its time up, it had this up. It was where you went to get STD testing, etc. What it says here is it warns women in the porn industry what diseases to be careful of. So first of all, we know a major thing that happens to them is rectal prolapses. What happens regularly is because of the rough anal sex, your anus falls out and it needs to get sewn back up. Now, let me tell you something. Shira Tarrant came to hear me give a talk and then she tweeted. And you know what her tweet was? She's just heard Gail Dines talk. She said something like this. Just heard Gail Dines talk about anal prolapse or rectal prolapse. She says, and checked with a doctor and he said, it's not that serious. It's easy to do. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. No problem. Go, you know, have it sewn up, you're all fine. This talks about gonorrhea of the eye, chlamydia of the anus. You know, it's what happens. Every generation, we have a group of women born who should have this happen to them, okay? And the rest of us should think they're empowered through it. I mean, what kind of a, of a feminism is this, that this is how we live, that we live in this world comfortable in our elite status, and we let a whole bunch of women have to deal with this on their own. Now, also about race, Shira Tarrant criticises me because I argue, stupid me, that pornography is racist, both in its structure and its discourse. She says, surely there's racism in the porn industry. It affects how people of colour are represented and treated. But there are counter stories. So me, unsophisticated, stupid me, I'm missing the counter stories. So let's look at some of these counter stories. Because she quotes, let's, she quotes... Cinnamon Love, who then says Lexington Steel is doing some really interesting thing around this. So I'm thinking, okay, let's see what counter stories Lexington Steel is coming out with. So I went on to Lexington Steel's pole position collection. Now, I didn't put the images up here because they're so violent, but this is the text. Wouldn't you love to be in the driver's seat while Lex unleashes his massive cock on hungry bitches? Get Lex's unique point of view as his whores kneel and spread to suck fuck and eat the last drop of cum from his huge cock. These are your counter stories, okay? Someone's going to have to explain to me afterwards how this is counter. <laughs> Next one, his heavy metal collection. Lexington puts his metal to the test as he pushes ball deep into the industry's most renowned assholes. Will these porn stars sustain the damages as Lex's heavy cock rips them apart? Only the real stars will emerge from the ultimate anal test. So 
in Ms. Magazine, a feminist magazine, my book, Pornland, is being critiqued because I'm not talking about the counter stories of Lexington Steel. And then she goes on to say, next one. Then she goes on to say, Tarrant argues that Gail Dines' generalizations about porn being racist and sexist is dangerous and responsible. So go back, go back one. So he's not dangerous and irresponsible, right? No, 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 not him. It's me, okay? I'm the one who's dangerous for women's health. And it's the same thing, by the way, when you talk about the so-called sex workers. It's not the Johns and the Pimps. Right? It's the radical feminists who are beating up on prostituted women. I bet you didn't know that, but we're the dangerous ones. Okay, next one. So, Tarrant's critique of my book, I would argue, or all third wave, lacks an understanding of the historical roots of racism as a founding material and representational reality in the US. You will not understand this here in England the same way. Racism was a founding moment of every institution in the United States of America. And also, the nature of systematic racism that I discuss in my book is rendered invisible by the stories of a few individuals. Again, Martin Luther King having a discourse that talks about his experiences rather than a dream. So let's just talk about two other things now that's going on. Let's tell you how feminism has lost its way in the real world. Let's begin with this quote from a Toronto police officer who said that women should avoid dressing like sluts, okay? So what's the response to this? Okay, well, when I was a younger feminist, well, the response would have been, we marched down there, right? And we basically, I remember Dworkin once said, if you don't like an institution, you, just, you dismantle it brick by brick, okay? Well, that's what we would have done and gone and fought. Not today, okay? We don't like what he said, so what do we do? We dress like this, okay? And then we reclaim our slut hut. This is what's going to work. This is going to overthrow patriarchy. Women walking around like this. Now, you know what? I want to say something. These are the next picture. These are young women, okay? I understand that in the porn culture. My question is, where were the older feminists? This was an example of absolute and utter irresponsibility on the part of older feminists to say to these younger women we understand this energy let's organize it let's figure out a way how to do it i'll give you an i was on the um we bbc world service with one of the organizers i'm not going to say her name she's a young woman in her 20s and we're on the world bbc world service right thousands if not millions of people listening to us she is enraged at me she said, how dare you come in and criticize us? If you don't like it, she said, start your own movement. And I said, no, listen. So I said, I did. It's called the feminist movement. And you're in my movement, honey. I'm not in yours, OK? Do you understand that? She walked into my movement. And I said to her, what did you think? You were going to march into this movement do what you want, and nobody was going to criticize you. I said, this is what movements do. Right? And I know we have the Norwegians here. They have the best way of organizing a movement that I have ever seen, the way that you do. Because you wouldn't allow this shit to go down, OK? Would, am I right? OK, yes. <laughs> so I am saying we have to, you know, get in there. I'm not saying as older feminists we go in and we smack, smack, smack and say you can't do this. But you mentor. That's what you do. It means something, right? Our wisdom and our knowledge. When I was 22, I couldn't have done what I do now. So there's something to be said for wisdom, which doesn't mean we render invisible younger people. It means that we sort of build a movement together. So this is the result, okay? This is where it ends. It ends with women like this, dressing like this, basically reproducing it. So, carry on. So, this is Jacqueline Friedman, another third wave feminism. Anyone heard of her in this country? Yeah. A few. So she spoke at the Boston Slot Walk. 3,000 women, and this was her speech at the end. If you've ever been called a slut, stand up now and say together, I am a slut. Stand up and say it with me. I am a slut. I am a slut. I am a slut. All right, how did we get to this incredible point that this is feminism? I am a slut, okay? Now, let's, let's imagine for a minute that we take Jacqueline Friedman's advice 
and that our future way to liberation is to claim that we're sluts. Just let's take that on face value. So I'm going to offer this woman her claim to this, okay? I'm going to say that her answer to her oppressed state, right, Miss Diallo, is to say she's a slut. So she should walk down the street claiming, I am a slut, I am a slut, I am a slut. Do you all know who she is? Yes. Right, because Miss Diallo is Dominic Strauss-Kahn's victim. Next one. Okay, so let's imagine this. The same time that the slut walks are going on, the head of the IMF, right? We're not talking any, you know, small job here. We're talking the head of the IMF rapes a woman. Okay, rape, there's no question it was rape. His blood and her semen up the bathroom walls would be enough evidence for me, okay? Rapes her. And then, let's imagine, she says, her defense, but I'm a slut. I'm empowered by it. Well, indeed, she didn't have to make that defense because the next week in the New York Post, this is what they say. DSK made a hooker. So you know what? If you're white, upper middle class and older, maybe you can get away with this shit and saying I'm a slut. Let me tell you, if you're a woman of color, if you're a poor white woman, that is going to stick like mud. So again, what does it mean for a major figure of third wave, Jacqueline Freeman, as the Dominic Strauss-Kahn is going on, to suggest that the answer is to claim one slut? How elitist and privileged can you be to not understand the repercussions of what you're saying is going to have on other women? And now to the most awful thing in the thing, right? Fifty Shades of Grey, okay? Right, I'm trying not to seek absolutely weep in the corner every time I see this book. So let's think about what this is, okay? Fifty Shades of Grey has been described as a romantic love story, and I would add for the porn age. <laughs> All right, so let's look at this romantic. Has anyone read it? No. All right, well, I'm going to introduce. <laughs> okay, I've saved you. I've saved you a lot of heartache because I'm going to tell you. So it bought be beyond boring, right? Okay, so let's talk about the romantic love story. Okay, so he gives her rules, a contract she has to sign, and in this contract he tells her that he demands absolute obedience, when she can sleep, when she can eat. She's not allowed to snack between meals unless he gives her the snacks. The clothes she wears, which he buys, exercise, and he chooses the, tra the personal trainer, okay? The hygiene and beauty, how to keep that going, personal safety, ugh, joke, and personal quality. So he explains all of these things to her and gives her a list. And I'll give you an example of one of them. The obedience, this is on the contract. The submission will obey, will obey any instructions given by the dominant immediately without hesitation or reservation. The submissive will agree to any sexual activity deemed fit and pleasurable by the dominant accepting those activities that are outlined in hard limits. She will do so eagerly and without hesitation. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea of Mr. Gray. I don't want you to think he's not a good guy. He's actually a prince because he's got very clear limits and his limits are no fire play, <laughs> no urination or defecation, no needles, knife piercing or blood, no gynecological medical instruments, no acts involving children and no contact. I, you can't fault him. I mean, let's face it, <laughs> right? This is a prince in the porn age, okay? Now, I, have, I did an interview a few weeks ago. No, no, I did an interview with a few women and one of the things they said was it is a fairy story like Pretty Woman. Okay, so, so let's really talk about this. You've all seen Pretty Woman. Okay. So have you ever thought for a minute, and I'm quoting my good friend here, Jane Computer, have you ever thought for a minute how, you know, when there's a good film that comes out that makes tons of money, you get Batman 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yes, Die Hard 1, 2, 3, 4. Why was there no Pretty Woman Part 2? Have you ever thought about that? Really, think for a minute. Made a fortune. Why not? Well, let's imagine this. So they get married, the John and the prostitute, and they live happily, happily ever after, except on their honeymoon, they have a bit of a fight. What's he going to turn around and say to her? You fucking whore, right? You fight with me. You're going right back on the streets where I got you from. What happy ending do you know of a John who marries a prostituted woman? That's why there's no Pretty Woman Part 2. Although, as Jane Caputi so rightly points out, the, woman, the film that Julia Roberts made after that actually was Pretty Woman Part 2. You know what it was called? Sleeping with the Enemy. Right? That's exactly what it would have looked like. 
Okay, now, signs of an abusive man. Jealousy, possessiveness, controlling, superiority complex, manipulative, whirlwind romancer, comes in, showers you off your feet, has mood swings, sexually abusive. Let me tell you, this... If you meet a man who's got one of these, it's dangerous. Two, beyond the pale. Every single one, lethal. This is the description of Mr. Grey. So in this love story, okay, of Fifty Shades of Grey, let me tell you, Fifty Shades of Grey, one, two, three. I'm going to write Fifty Shades of Grey, four. You know what? At that point, she's running for her life to a battered women's shelter. Right? She's scarred all over from the wounds that aren't healing. She's got two traumatized, terrified children, and he would rather kill her than let her leave. And I have met women who have been on the run for 10, 15, 20 years from these men. So I think we should collectively write Fifty Shades Part 4. Let real women know. So we have gotten to the point is how is it possible that women are buying into their own demise? My question is, are we, as a radical feminist movement, becoming a movement without a constituency? Has our constituency gone to the other side? Have they have been so completely colonised that they will buy in to their own demise to such a degree as they're buying Fifty Shades of Grey? This is a terrible, terrible moment in history. Right? You understand what this says. I can tolerate fighting the porn industry and lots of things because a lot of it's going up against men. I can tolerate that. When I see women doing this, there is a level of despair that we can't give in to, I need to make clear, but it is terrible. So the answer. The answer, of course, is a feminist movement. Now, this is from Details. And this is, actually, I think this is Maxim. And they're saying, you start from here and you end here. Well, what we say is you start here and you end there. <laughs> without the cigarette. Now, we have got to figure out a way. We have got to figure out a way that we take the brilliant insights of radical feminism and that we make them applicable and real to our younger women. And I have to say, Sheila's book on beauty and misogyny, when I use that in my classes, and I use it every semester, and I tell this story, that in my advanced feminist theories class, my students read a book, and then the next week they have to write a paper on it. When they read beauty and misogyny, they can't write the paper. They need two weeks, because it is so profound for them. It upends their world. Right? in a way that very, we need to take this kind of stuff and spread it around. We need to figure out. We cannot let the third wave argue it is a generational issue. You understand? That will kill us because then we all look old history and dinosaurs. We are not a generational issue. We are absolutely an ideological issue. So how do we do this? Gramsci said, you need pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will which means be realistic what you're up against, right? But always be optimism of the will. Remember that change is always possible. But change and my optimism of the will is collective agency. You want to talk about agency, fine, but it's collective agency. It's women as a group, as a class, respecting and fighting for those that are more oppressed than us, like women of colour, poor white women, we must always remember that, that there's got to be a really nuanced way of bringing women together as a group. But our optimism, our optimism of our will has to be collective agency. We have to turn to each other and understand and say, you know what, I'm okay. I'm actually doing okay out of this system, but you're not. And you know what, I will fight to the death till you're okay because it's not about me, it's about you. This is the key to feminism. And we have, as I said in my last lecture here, I said, you know what? Somehow the feminist movement is run by women who are actually 14-year-old boys with hard-ons, because all they talk about is sex. Sex, 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 right? Who else talks about sex? A 14-year-old boy with a hard-on, right? We've got other things to do. You know, orgasms are very nice, but revolutions are better, right? <laughs> they really, really are. So what I want to say... One optimism of the will is stoppornculture.org. There are groups who are going to start a stop porn culture here in the UK. 
We have them all over the United States of America. They're talking about starting it in Norway. I'm going to Iceland in October to meet with the government and the Icelandic feminists. They're going to start it there. We're talking about stop porn culture in Australia. We need a movement. This should be one of many, not the only one. But what I have to say, in these times when we have the Fifty Shades of Grey, we have the slot walks, we have women calling themselves feminists who are actually pornographers, it is very, very easy to absolutely seep into despair. But if we seep into despair, we do the devil's work. You understand that you do the work of your enemies. Someone once said to me on a radio show, they said to me, Gail Dines, he said, aren't you pushing a boulder up a hill? And I said, yes, of course I'm pushing a boulder up a hill. That's what you do to make the world livable. You push boulders up hills. The labor movement pushed the boulder up the hill. The women's movement pushed boulders up hills. Civil rights movement pushed boulders up hills. That's the way you do it. What choice do we have? But you know what? I alone and you alone can't push that boulder up that hill. But together, just think what we can do. So please, let's think about how we revitalize this movement and how we stop this kind of fun feminism, okay? And we get out, because remember, the fun feminists are a small percentage. We shouldn't get too focused on them. Because when you go out into the real world and you speak to real women, they're not talking about fun feminism. They're talking about how they're going to feed their children. They're talking about how they're going to deal with this man who is undermining their ability to parent their children in ways they want to. Some of them are running away from battery. These are our constituents. <laughs> And unless we keep our eyes on that and take our eyes off what I often call white noise, right? The pro-porn feminists, they're white noise. And our job is to stay focused on who these women are. That is what the feminist movement was always should be about. That is our future. It is our past and it is now our future. Thank you. Thank you.